Often we have events for which we can calibrate the probability or estimate it from past events and we say, okay, we toss a coin over and over again and I'm asking you what's the probability it's going to come up ahead and you look at the past 100 cases and you take this as an estimate of that. And often we actually define probability by this very notion of empirical frequency and that's the way you'd explain it to your little brother if your brother would ask you, what do you mean by probability? Probably you would give an explanation that's based on the law of large numbers, only take the law of large numbers as a definition of probability, which is a little bit like turning it upside down because the law of large numbers says that when you have uh, many events that have the same probability and are independent and the average converge to the probability, you need probability to understand that. And that's Bernoulli in um, early 18th century. But um, typically, intuitively, we actually use this as a definition of probability. And that's what we call um, objective probability, more or less objectively given. You could try it, everyone could toss the coin so many times, everyone can uh, look at a deck of cards and, and play with it and so on. Uh, but there are events for which the, we don't have such empirical frequencies. And uh, the wonderful example by Blaise Pascal was when he at some point became much more of a philosopher than a mathematician and he tried to explain to a putative uh, conversant as to why you should believe in God. And uh, this is known as Pascal's wager. I mean, the argument basically goes that, um, I mean, the standard way we think about it is that it's safer to bet on the existence of God than not. The actual argument is really wonderful, it's very, uh, very nuanced, because Pascal starts by telling us, you know, either there is God or there isn't. So he's talking about what we call today like states of the world, we could, have, we could be living in this world or that world, and you could choose to become a believer or not. He's also sensitive to the fact that you, just, you don't just choose what to believe, but you could maybe work on yourself to eventually become a believer. And then his first argument is an argument about what we now call in modern theory dominance, that one act is simply better than the other no matter what. So no matter what state of the world I'm at, this act gives you a higher payoff. And his argument is basically, look, if God does not exist, what have you lost? And if God exists, you gain life in heaven. And then he goes on with this putative discussion, says, should you say that to believe in God costs you something? Because there are all these carnal pleasures that are awaiting you on earth and you have to give them up if you want to become a believer. But then he says, well, uh, whatever awaits you here on earth is finite and the afterlife is infinite. And therefore, in modern language, you would say that even if the probability that God exists is very, very small, as long as it's positive, the small number times the infinite payoff beats any finite payoff that you could get here. And in modern language, we would call it expected utility. Expected utility theory says you should take the possible outcomes, assign a certain numbers that we call them utility to say how desirable they are, so a more desirable outcome gets a higher utility. To the different scenarios, you assign probabilities. Okay? And then what you do is calculate what we call mathematical expectation, namely probability times value plus probability times value. You add them up and you get expected utility, and you choose the act that gives you a higher expected utility. And since Pascal was the person who invented the notion of mathematical expectation, there was little doubt that this is what he had in mind. But the amazing thing in this argument, and back, you know, 1650s where we're talking, um, the probability that God exists cannot possibly be something which is an empirical frequency. It's not like we have witnessed many universes in some God did exist and some did not. That's not the story. So evidently what we have in mind when we think about the probability that God exists is something else. It's not the empirical frequency. So what is it? And what Pascal really has in mind is, I'd say again, in modern term, I would rephrase it as the following. We have this beautiful machinery of probability theory. It works perfectly nicely when we have statistics and we have the data. But maybe we could use it also when we don't have the data. Well, maybe even if we don't have the objective probabilities like what's the probability that my car be stolen, yes, no, make a decision about insurance or something like that. Even if it's only yes or no that I cannot repeat, I don't have empirical frequencies over, still the discipline put on my reasoning by the mathematical model can allow me to reach a better decision. 
And a better decision here, I would say, and I would stress it throughout, would be in my own eyes. Okay, so at the end of the day, you ask me, in Pascal's case, should I or should not become a believer? And the, the argument is, you know, I think that I thought about it in a more reasonable way. I think I clarified things to myself. And it's not that we necessarily have to buy the argument. Um, I mean, there are lots of discussions in the philosophical literature until today about that. And it's quite obvious that if you were to take it seriously, they have to say, wait a minute, which God? Because it could be different gods and they, what, they demand different things. And each one of them can send you to hell for different things. There's no way to appease all of them. So um, what I'm trying to say is not to, to believe in God necessarily, but to believe in Pascal, because Pascal was amazing being a believer himself in phrasing the question this way and in coming up with some of the most basic ideas of decision theory, which is the decision matrix separating what you can do from what you cannot control in the states of the world, using probability machinery to quantify your beliefs even when it doesn't have the empirical frequency idea. The expected utility idea, which is used till today, it's the most important or most popular idea in economics, finance, decision theory. Um, then there was the idea of expected utility appeared more explicitly in the works of Daniel Bernoulli in the early 18th century, but I would say it was left dormant for about 200 years. And basically there, was, there were development in statistics, but there wasn't much going on in social science as such. Um, in the sense of mathematical approach to decision making was not very um, common. Uh, economics made progress, but in a relatively not very mathematical way, uh, somewhat um, less related to individual decision making. Um, there were many writings in the 19th century that were influenced by cognitive psychology, what we'd call today cognitive psychology but the argumentation was rather intuitive and the whole notion of science was at the time less uh, well formed. And things changed dramatically in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Logical positivism came to the rise in defining of what science should be like, mostly dealing with physics, but apparently economists uh, adopted that around 1930s. Economists wanted to have the science which is real respectable science like physics or something, which in particular meant that any theoretical concept should be related to observations. And what we call today in economics the revealed preference paradigm is the idea that your utility is something that I measure from your behavior. It's not that I can figure it out on my own because I'm so smart, but rather I look at what you do and if you are sufficiently consistent to have a utility, to be described as if you are maximizing utility, that's what I'm going to call the your utility function. So me as an outside observer, observing your choices and saying, oh, he behaves as if he's making, maximizing this utility. And the same idea came with expected utility. And then were fantastically beautiful axiomatic works by Bruno Definetti on um, probability, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern in the context of expected utility with given probabilities. And then the work of Leonard Savage about putting these things together, which is to show that if, when you make decisions, you are sufficiently coherent in a well-defined way, there are several things that we call axioms, assumptions about your behavior, which are mostly assumptions about coherence. If you made this decision here and that decision there, then probably you'd make another decision there with some logic. Then you behave as if you have a utility function and you have a probability, which is going to be your own subjective probability, such that an outside observer can describe your behavior by maximization of expected utility. So this idea of, of Pascal got to be in the 1950s, got to be sort of reestablished or proposed again, but this time with very solid axiomatic foundations, by which I mean there are conditions about behavior that are equivalent to this mathematical formulation. And this axiomatization, namely this axiomatic system that is equivalent, shown to be mathematically equivalent to this particular model, uh, convinced the profession basically that this is the right way to make decisions. This is what rationality is about. And uh, it was a little bit slow, but um, within a few decades, this became the main workhorse of economic theory, game theory, decision theory. 
both for describing how people behave and for uh, suggesting how people should behave, what we call the, the normative approach, which is sort of more preaching, saying that's the right way to make decisions. It has remained dominant for many years. It has been challenged here and there. There were works by Maurice Allais in the 50s, Daniel Ellsberg in the 60s, but by and large, not a lot of challenge from, the, from evidence, let's say, until the works of Kahneman, Tversky and their followers, uh, who in the 70s and 80s and later on show that many of these assumptions don't really hold and, and individuals don't really behave according to these assumptions. Uh, very nicely designed experiments that got people thinking as to what do we do with a the theory? Is it, does it describe how people behave? And if not, what should we do about it? Today we are, we are at a point where we have, I think, two very impressive bodies of literature. One comes from decision theory, game theory, microeconomic theory, operations research, which describes what I would call the rational choice paradigm, for lack of a better word. Uh, I don't want to choose the word theory for reasons I'll explain in a second. But it's a very beautiful construction, very elegant, that shows how mathematics can help us in describing decision-making, in um, recommending decisions, and so on. On the other hand, we have a very impressive body of psychological findings that show that almost nothing works. Amos Tversky uh, used to say, give me the axiom, I'll, I'll come up with the experiment that violates it. And indeed, there are lots of works of his and, and, and Danny Kahneman and their followers that show that almost everything you write down doesn't always work. And the question is, what do we do between the two? Okay. And my uh, thought on this is that we have to, we can, basically can take one of two approaches when we see theory and reality that don't conform to each other. One thing which is normal in all sciences is to say, okay, let's improve the theory and get it closer to reality, just improve it, refine it in a Popperian way. This is what we should be doing to falsify the old theory and come up with a better one. But in the social sciences, there's the other possibility, and this is to bring reality closer to theory by teaching people, because we can say, look, if you make mistakes in, say, conditional probabilities, um, maybe I can teach you how to do it better. Maybe I can go to high schools and teach kids how to calculate con conditional probabilities. Um, yes, I can exploit it in, say, a marketing setup and say, people make mistakes, so let me maybe make money out of that. But another approach would be to say, let's teach them and maybe they will not make so many mistakes. Which one should we choose? I'm trying to promote a definition of rationality which is precisely based on this distinction. Namely, if I can talk to people and show them that they don't follow the theory, and then they say, oh my God, I was stupid, next time I'll do better, and they actually do better, then I say it was irrational for them, because by preaching the theory, I can make them change their behavior. If, on the other hand, I preach the theory, and I jump up and down, and, and I teach, and I talk, and I tell jokes, but at the end of the day, they're left cold, and they keep behaving in the same way, what good have I done? So I would say that probably for them, it's rational, okay? So I'm trying to promote a definition of rationality that's not about you know, wisdom or mathematical sophistication. And in general, it's not like a title of, or honorary title that I, the decision theorist, bestow upon you, the decision maker. Rather, I view the role of a decision theorist as someone who's supposed to help a decision maker in their own eyes. So I have to go back to you and say, do you feel more comfortable with the decisions you make now? Or do you feel less comfortable with the way you behaved before and maybe this model can help you? To the extent that I can convince you, you were rational before, you're maybe more rational now. To the extent I can convince you, I can call your names, but as far as I'm concerned, you're rational in the sense that the theory cannot change your behavior. So the examples of violations of the classical theory, there are many that um, are definitely irrational in the sense that most people feel uncomfortable about uh, uh, the way they behave. And you have a feeling that next time they'll behave closer to the theory. But not all are such. So in particular, if you go back to the question of probabilities, um, people sometimes do not satisfy the axioms of Leonard Savage in the 1950s. And then you show this to them. You say, look, you behaved in this way, and here is a very pretty axiom with beautiful logic. Now what do you do? And um, my point is, so let's say that a couple of people, including David Schmeiler, who used to be my advisor, and, and, and others, are arguing that it's not always rational to satisfy these axioms, because there are situations where you just cannot come up with probabilities, 
And then maybe it is more rational to admit that than to pretend that you can. So even though the axioms are, look very pretty, sometimes um, it's not extremely practical. And there are some situations where assigning probabilities to things is completely, uh, seems to be completely um, unfounded. I'll just to a quick, a quick example, suppose that I come up with two terms you've never heard of, like arbodites and cyclophines, and I ask you, do you think that all arbodites are cyclophines? And you've never heard these terms. Now, if you do assign probabilities to everything, which is what's called the Bayesian approach, then you should tell me, yes, with probability 62% or 59% or whatever. And the point is that you have no idea. Okay? If you could try to say 50-50 and ask you, what about maybe all cyclophines are arbodites? Maybe these are two disjoint sets. Maybe the metacyclophines are a separate type of pseudo arbodite I mean, I can make up words to say, look, at some point you say, I don't know. And the problem with assigning probabilities to everything is that it, you cannot tell in this language, I do not know. Okay. You, if you say, I have no idea, I'll ask you, how much do you not know? Do you not know 0.6 or 0.7? And the language does not have the statement to say, I don't have the foggiest idea. So in this sense, we feel that it's not necessarily the most rational, and we test it by talking to people and saying, okay, you behaved in a way that's con that contradicts the axioms, now, do you want to change your behavior? And often they say, no, just because I don't have any idea how to assign probabilities to that, I do not. And part of the recent work in recent decades is coming up with different decision theories that would allow for uh, situations where you don't have probabilities for all events.